Hi, my name is Brad Neal with the University of Indianapolis. Um, we've had some issues with the previous video and getting it working, so we're going to do this video quick, fast, and dirty. So my apologies on that. Um, the, section 4.3 of the OpenStax textbook, which you can see the page here uh, beside me, behind me, um, all this is really getting you set for is the idea of how to make sure that you can do balanced equations. So we've worked on balanced equations and term in previous parts of uh, the material already. This just goes through another explanation of how to do balancing equations. Um, and so the beginning, it goes through different examples. The key thing that I want you to realize is when you do a balancing equation, you're going to have to do moles to moles comparisons anytime you're writing out balanced equations. And we're going to do some example problems here in a second. Um, but they've got this really nice little diagram here for here's your moles to moles. And this is specifically coming from the balanced equation that they have written out. So for you to do any of the predictions in terms of how much mass of product you're going to need, how much, or I'm sorry, how much mass of product you're going to generate, how many moles of reactant you're ne gonna need, how much mass of reactant you're gonna need, you have to make sure that you have a balanced equation. Um, and then you have to make sure that um, you are comparing the moles of one species to the moles of another species using the balanced equation. And that ultimately is this entire section in a nutshell. As long as you remember to balance your equations and then you remember to get to a mole to mole relationship, either it be between two reactants, two products, um, reactant to product, product to reactant, whatever. Um, and then you compare moles to moles using the correct stoichiometry, you're set. You've got this chapter, or I'm sorry, you've got this section pretty much done. Um, all of the various flow charts that you'll see throughout the entirety of this reading are going to really be predicated on whatever you start with, convert it to moles, then do your stoichiometric relationship uh, to get from moles of one thing to moles of another thing, and then you can use molar mass or whatever it is to get to a quantity that we would actually measure in the lab because we don't measure moles out in the lab. We measure mass, we measure volume. Um, we don't measure moles, but we can get to moles using things like our molar mass. We can get to moles like using things like molarity, et cetera. Um, and there's this big old table right here that has all of these different ways. So if we're reading this from left to right, you pretty much are saying, okay, am I starting with either a volume or am I starting, um, yeah, am I starting with a volume of a pure mass or am I starting with volume of a solution? And then, so you pick one of those lanes, either the top one, the middle one, or the bottom one, and then you follow the arrows as you go across from left to right in order to end up at the right destination. But please note, no matter which section you start with the top middle or the bottom on the left hand side you always have to get to moles moles are what we're going to be using that stoichiometric factor they have it labeled here that's what's going to be able to get you from component a into component b it's a mole to mole ratio that stoichiometric factor is the stoichiometric what i call the stoichiometric ratio which comes from your balanced equations if you don't have the balanced equation then you're in rough shape um, and so then the entire rest of this is just explaining that in more ways. This is the crux of the overall concept though. Um, so now that we've got that crux of the overall concept, um, let me add in a couple more things here. Um, do remember that anything that is on the left-hand side of a balanced equation is called your reactants. Let's go full screen here. Just a anything that is on the left-hand side of your equation is called your reactants. Anything on your right-hand side of your equation is called your products. Um, and when, anytime you write out any kind of balanced equation, you always have to balance it. We practice those in discussion you're just going to probably have to practice these over and over and over until you can feel 
100% confident that you're doing this right because this is uh, absolutely vital to all chemistry that you will do um, in any level of chemistry after this. Um, so in terms of the snowball effect, this very much will uh, snowball into a huge snowball or avalanche, um, especially uh, and that, that, well, that avalanche either is really working in your favor in terms of you know how to use it so you can utilize it or it's working against you because it's not made sense. Um, this is where I would throw in a pitch to show up to office hours um, and I'd be more than happy to talk with you and give you uh, exact examples and help you figure out what's not making sense to you if this kind of relationship isn't working. So one of the key things that I think uh, we need to talk about and remind ourselves for is um, when you write out a reaction, you have to balance it. Before you balance it, though, you need to make sure that you have uh, chemical formulas that are written correctly. And so there's a couple, based off of your reading, you hopefully know that there's a number of times types of chemical reactions that exist out there. So let's go ahead and let's start working some examples then. Oops, not that button. No, that was the right button. We're doing great. Okay, so let's start talking about some of those examples explicitly. So like we've got all these different kinds of things. So, oops, we've got all these different kinds of things. Um, such as our oxidation reduction, our combustion, so learn how to spell, oxidation reduction, a lot of times you're just going to see this labeled as redox reactions. This is the kind of reaction that we said you're not going to be responsible for for balancing in chemistry 150 gave you the example video from last week on how to do that balancing but you're not going to be strictly speaking responsible for it um, so we're going to leave that one in that red color we also have the single displacement which is really um, single displacement A single displacement is really just a form of oxidation reduction reaction. Um, something that you might have there would be like your, uh, an example of like copper solid um, mixing with, um, let's see here, I think that this is a reaction that takes place. Let's not so do that one, let's do gold chloride. Um, <coughs> aqueous, and then you guys can't see that, so let's hide the PowerPoint here for a second. Um, the thing here would be, because it's a single displacement, we take the one thing here and we say, what would happen if it takes the place of the cation with the existing anion, copper, chloride, plus gold. Now the one thing that you guys don't have the access to um, is the, the fact of um, oxidation reduction potentials. So predicting these kinds of reactions is hard. So I wouldn't actually ask you uh, to do a single displacement reaction on a test. Not at this point in your chemical careers because you need more knowledge from general chemistry one. One thing that is totally possible for you to do is for me to say solid copper. So I could say copper plus gold three. Gold, apparently we put a U in there. Gold three chloride. Chloride forms. Forms copper two chloride and solid gold. So what you would, so the key thing that I'm wanting to bring up to you is this copper two right here, 
you need to write that out properly in your chemical formulas. Um, so anytime you write out a chemical formula, you have to make sure that you are doing the balancing correctly. And in this regard, to do the balancing correctly, we have to say that the copper has this plus two charge, each chloride has a negative one. So overall, we have to put this two down here for our copper chloride to actually be a neutral compound. That is going to uh, show up quite a bit in our um, double displacement reactions. So I'm going to say double displacement. And our double displacements, yeah, that's not the world's best and whatever. Our double displacement reactions um, will typically be given to you in terms of words. Um, but the trick that your trick, I say, that you're gonna um, gonna need to think about when you do these is your solubility table. So you're gonna have to go to that solubility table to then figure out after you do the exchange of your ions, because you're trying to see if the cation of one of our soluble species reacts with the anion of another soluble species, will it precipitate form? So if we follow the pink arrows here and we could say, will the barium sulfate be soluble or not soluble? Will the potassium nitrate be soluble or not soluble? But I want you to notice very importantly here that because the barium has this two charge and then the sulfate has this negative two charge, I write it out as the electrically neutral species. Same thing with the potassium. So the potassium has a plus one, the nitrate has a negative one overall, right? It is then incumbent upon us to go in and do the balancing of this reaction, especially before we do anything of any kind of consequence. Um, such as the actual kinds of materials here in uh, this section of the book. So you would do your balancing. You would say, I've got one barium, I've got one barium. You stay with it. I've got one sulfate, and over here I've got one sulfate. So the sulfates are happy. Stay with it. I've got two potassium, but over here I've only got one potassium. You have to remember to use your stoichiometric coefficient to balance the potassium. So this is now saying we've got two potassiums. It's also saying that we have two nitrates. So now I've got two nitrates and I come back over to my reactant side and I've got two nitrates. So the nitrate's happy. So now I have a balanced chemical equation. This is where you look on your solubility rules and you figure out what is insoluble and what isn't. And this again, I'm gonna beg, borrow, and plead you all please do go ahead and memorize the solubility rules. Your life will just be a lot easier. <laughs> All right, so the whole point of the chapter though is to get you to start doing some kinds of unit conversions. Example problem like what we have here Uh, yeah, so example problems like what we've got here on the uh, PowerPoint, you can't do any of your mass or mole to mole relationships unless you get that stoichiometry down. You have to take an equation like we've got here for this calcium phosphate and we have to get that balanced correctly. Um, I guess the calcium phosphate one is really um, the second reaction that we should be looking at, the first one we should be looking at is the top one. That's the oxidation of ethanol or the combustion of ethanol. Um, and that's ethanol would be the C, uh, H2, C, H3 written incorrectly. Cause really the C, H3 and two should be split plus our O2 going to form carbon dioxide and water. So before we could do anything else there, we have to do our balancing. 
the only bummer about this kind of problem and these combustion kinds of reactions is that we can't do the back and forth thing that we did with the barium uh, nitrate ex example up above. Here we really are just going to have to count up our number of species. Um, and now that we don't need to actually write out or see that problem, we can actually write, use the whole page. Here we've got two carbons on our, re on our reactant side. On our product side, we have just the one, so we're going to put a two in. Now the two applies to the carbon and the two applies to our oxygen, bringing the oxygen from our carbon dioxide up to a total of four. Whatever you do, though, don't try to balance the oxygens. Always wait for oxygen when you're doing a combustion reaction to balance it last. What you would want to do first is come back and do all of your hydrogens. So right now we've got five hydrogens here. We've got two hydrogens here for a total of five, plus one more, we're up to six. On our reactant side, we've got only three. So now we have a, or I'm sorry, we only had two. So we have to put a three as our stoichiometric coefficient. So we have six hydrogens. But this also is gonna apply to the oxygens and the water molecules that get formed. So overall now, the oxygen on our reactant side, or I'm sorry, our product side is gonna be four, that's a terrible way of writing that, four plus the three, so seven total oxygens. Now if we come to the product side, the reactant side, we're gonna get that done, we're gonna get that right one of these times. We should now see we had oxygen right here and we have oxygen within the ethanol itself. So we need a total of seven. This problem, as you've probably already figured out, isn't particularly hard in terms of if we drop a three here in front of this oxygen, we now have six coming from the oxygen here plus the oddball from the ethanol itself for a total of seven. So our, we have now gone through and we have successfully balanced this equation and I'm gonna write or erase some of these lines here just to try to make it a little cleaner so it's a little easier to see. But we have put in our stoichiometry to be able to balance this equation. These kinds of things just take time to, to practice um, and before you can really get particularly great at these, you're going to have to be able to um, know what your ions are. This is one of the big reasons that we harped on trying to get you to memorize your ions and gave you that quiz over them. Um, because if you look at PO4 and you say like, oh, well, that's phosphorus and four oxygens, um, what you're going to miss is that that phosphate, which is what it is, has a negative three charge. And so it's gonna make just doing all of these problems so much harder. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is before you can even really predict what your products are truly gonna be, you need to know what your ions are in the things that you're working with. If you don't know what those ions are, you're probably gonna not be able to pick the right uh, reactants, or I'm sorry, you're not gonna be able to pick the right products anyways. And you're not going to recognize that this is a double displacement kind of reaction that is taking place with this calcium uh, phosphate sulfuric acid reaction up above my head. So to recap, if you don't have those ions already memorized, you need to get those ions memorized. Two, you need to be able to convert your chemical names into chemical formulas. If you can't write out the chemical formulas from the chemical names, it might be because you don't know your ions. Either way, if you don't know your ions, you probably can't write your formulas. And if you can't write your formulas, then predicting your products is gonna be very difficult. Your products are typically going to be either carbon dioxide and water, like in the case of a combustion reaction that we had, that we just worked, or your product is gonna be something that looks like this double displacement kind of reaction here where you're gonna ask yourself, does the cation of one of my species form something that's insoluble with the anion 
of the opposing species. So in this regard, with this example that we've got here, we've got the, we're asking ourselves to erase whatever gobbledygook that was. We're asking ourselves, if I have calcium ions and I add sulfate ions to it, is calcium sulfate the thing that's getting formed? Is that insoluble? And likewise, if I have protons and I've got phosphate, first off, what do I form? H3PO4 because we're running a hypothetical scenario of does the cation, which the cation on sulfuric acid would be our proton, react with the anion of the other species, which would be the phosphate, in order for everything to be balanced out because the protons have a plus one charge, the phosphate has a negative three charge, thus we need to have three of these things. So that's why we're writing it out as phosphoric acid like there. Is the phosphoric acid soluble or not soluble? Once you've identified these species solubilities and you've written out, well, first, once you've written out these species correctly, then you can identify whether these species are soluble or not. Once you've figured out whether they're soluble or not, then you can get to the matter at hand of balancing things out. So real quick, our calcium phosphate plus our sulfuric acid going to form our calcium so calcium sulfate plus the phosphoric acid. If we start with three calciums, we come over to our product side. There's no, there's only the one calcium here. So I put a three out in front to balance that out. That three is going to apply to the calcium and it's gonna to apply to the sulfate. So now I say I've got three sulfates and over on this side, I've only got the, my reactant side, I've only got one sulfate. So I need to put a three out in front of here so that I have three sulfates and I've got three hydrogens. Don't have three hydrogens, I've got six hydrogens because there was already a two here. So the three times two is six protons. Now I go back over to my product side and I've only got three. So to fix that, I need to put a two here as my stoichiometric coefficient. So now I've got six protons. I've also got two phosphates. I come back over my reactant side and I've got two phosphates. I'm back with my calcium. And I go back through it all again, just to make sure that everything looks right. Ion names, being able to generate proper chemical formulas, solubility in terms of when you mix the cation of one with the anion of the other does something in soluble form because if nothing in soluble forms, you have a no reaction, an NR. And if you have no reaction, there's no sense in balancing something that doesn't happen. Once you identify your solubility, then you can get to the task at hand, which would be balancing. So yeah, we've really now taken everything from chapter two through now to be able to get to the point in time where we can balance a chemical reaction. And we're going to do a separate video here about some practice problems of going from grams to moles, moles to grams in relationship to problems like these here. Hope that helped. We'll get that next video out as soon as possible. And my apologies for the delay on this one. Thanks.